Good morning, Eagle Heights Cathedral, and welcome to today's Sunday celebration service. Before we get started, I want to take a moment and invite you to join us for this year's Trunk or Treat Virtual Edition. Follow us on Instagram and Facebook, share with your family and friends for this great outreach event. With different activities and contests and challenges throughout the week, it will be sure to be an event you won't forget. Now join us for today's message from Bishop James E. Collins. Good morning, church. Good morning. If you could stand with me, if you could stand with me, man, there is no better place to be. I get excited because we get to worship him together. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you. Father God, thank you for the privilege and honor of being here. Father God, thank you for waking us up this morning, Lord. And Father, whatever is distracting us today, God, whatever issues we might be dealing with, God, whatever things are in the way, I pray right now that they will be removed so we can receive your word. And Father God, so we could be changed in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. Is God good and greatly to be praised? I can't hear you this morning. Is God good and greatly to be praised? My Lord. John 16, beginning at verse 12. Continuing to talk about truly led by the Spirit, properties of the Holy Spirit. John 16, verse 12 says, Jesus speaking, I still have many things to say to you. But you cannot bear them now. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority. But whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will tell you things to come. He will glorify me, for he will take of mine and declare it to you. A little while, and you will not see me. And again, a little while, and you will see me, because I go to the Father. Lord Jesus, thank you for loving us so much. And Father, thank you for giving us Jesus who gave us the Holy Spirit. And thank you that the three of you agree in one, but yet you work and operate separate assignments in our life, though you work together. And so Holy Spirit, show us God as the great, awesome God, the Creator. Show us Jesus with greater clarity, the Savior of the world, the one who died to redeem us. And show us today how you work in our lives, specifically to speak to us. And I thank you for it. For I ask these things in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen and amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. As we continue our journey through Galatians 5, seeking to truly be led of the Spirit, I want you to understand that I purposely entitled it Truly Led by the Spirit. Because there have been many well-meaning Christians who have done some not-so-good things in desiring to live by faith and bring glory and honor to God. And many times it has produced the opposite effect in that it brought dishonor rather than honor to the name of Jesus. For it's one of the, the privileges of growing up in a Christian home and in a Pentecostal atmosphere is that you were in a church where people really loved and desired to bring glory and honor to his name. But we also saw the tragedy of not being led by the Spirit. And what I've learned is that if we are not led by the Spirit, then our soul man will cause us to do things in the name of God that really will dishonor and bring defamation to the name of the Lord. Some have taken faith, living by faith, to boundaries of ignorant presumption that test God. The Bible says that we are not to test the Father, that though we are most like God, we are not God. In the early 70s, a group of Korean believers on an evangelistic mission came to a flooded river swollen and impassable with rain. And finding the bridge swept away, they began to claim by faith the experience of Christ and Peter as Peter walked on the water and they all plunged and they drowned. Their tragic and unnecessary deaths brought reproach on the Korean community, but more so on the name of Jesus. Years back, I was acquainted with a young man, a businessman, he gave up a six-figure salary and resigned because he said that God told him to quit his job and to start a church. He was to do nothing but to fast and to pray and to study the Word. He had six children, one in college and two were on the way. His wife had a decent paying job, but she didn't make enough money to make sure the whole family was cared for. And some people tried to encourage him to stay in his job while he was establishing the church. 
As his family began to struggle and suffer financially, the same people encouraged him and said, please go back to work and why don't you continue to build the ministry while you're still working? But he insisted, God told me. And in the process of it all, here is the short of the story. He lost his wife and his children as the two of them divorced and most tragically, the whole family blamed it on God. And for if indeed God told him, they asked the question, then why didn't God take care of us? My point is this, Romans 14 and 16 says this, let not then your good be evil spoken of. That scripture holds a lot more in teaching that I can't address right now. But the same could be said of being led by the Spirit. We must strive to be surely led by the Spirit. Let me say something that is very important. Be very, very, very careful to say God told me. Because here is what I know. If God speaks, if God calls for it, if God instructs it, if God is truly leading you, he will take care of you. I didn't say you wouldn't have struggle. But if God really calls for it, he will take care of you. Listen, if God orders it, he will pay for it. That's why we must be cautious that what we say and do in the name of the Lord, it must be truly him leading us. We must seek to be as sure as possible that we are being led by the Spirit. But with that said, I want to say again that God does want to speak to you. And no matter what the naysayers say, God does speak to us spirit to spirit. And again, his main way of speaking to you is through the Bible by the Holy Spirit, through the reading, the studying, and the preaching, and the teaching of the word. And I want to say it again. I cannot overemphasize that we have got to stop underestimating the power of the written word, for it is the number one way that God does speak to us. Nevertheless, we also must come to an understanding that God does speak to us through other avenues as well as through the Bible. And listen to me one more time. I'm going to keep repeating this until we grab it. A man with a testimony is never at the mercy of a critic. I want you to travel back with me to November 13, 2015. That was the week when we were going to lead up into the consecration service of me becoming a bishop. Follow me now. A couple of months before that, my oldest daughter began to communicate with one of my younger brothers, my younger brother Mike. Communicating with my younger brother, she began to talk to him about the consecration service. And in October, on a Wednesday night, m many of you will remember, I stood in this pulpit and I asked you, I said, please pray for my family because God spoke to me and said, if my brother Mike comes to this church, he will give his heart to Jesus. How many of you remember that? I asked you to pray. Yes, see, see, you remember that. I said, if you pray, God said to me that if he comes, he will give his heart to Jesus. Now, I want you to understand something. My brother Mike had never prayed the sinner's prayer. We had had grown up in a Christian home and for 30 plus years of his life he never once gave his heart to Jesus because my brother Mike is of the mindset if I'm going to do something I'm going to be real about it I'm not going to do it just to please people and so he is in that service but let me tell you how this went about it was the weekend when the Pittsburgh Steelers were playing now you have to understand something I am a rabbit Dallas Cowboys fan my wife Seahawks, she's from Seattle. My brother Mike, he is rabid about the Pittsburgh Steelers. And so as Jessica began to talk to him, we were saying there's no way he's going to come to this service on that weekend because that's his weekend every year that he would go to Pittsburgh. But I remember I asked you to pray. When Jessica invited him, my brother Mike made this statement. He said, if my brother James is becoming a bishop, then that is too important. Now listen. He canceled that trip with his son that they do every year. They got on a plane, he and his wife, and they flew here. They were in that service Friday night when I was consecrated. They were in that service on Sunday morning, and he was standing next to my wife, he and his wife. And tears began to flow in his eyes as he's listening to what's going on. And he keeps talking to my wife, and finally he leans over and he says to her, do you think he'll let me say something? And she goes, that depends on what you want to say. 
And he, he, she said, is it a good thing? And he said, yes. My brother Mike, the short of the story, he came on this platform. He began to share how he felt about our relationship. And at the end of that service, I asked him one question. I said, let me ask you something. Will you allow your brother to pray with you as you give your heart to Jesus? And with tears streaming in his eyes, he gave his heart to Jesus and 30 other people in that service got saved. I said that to say this to you. Do not tell me that God does not speak to us. Please understand, he speaks spirit to spirit, and a man with a testimony is never at the mercy of a critic. It's not that we're more spiritual than other people. It is not that we are focusing on some spiritual outer limits. It is not that we have an in with God. But listen to me this morning. There is an intimacy that can be found in, for all of us if we will just draw nigh unto him where God will speak to us and we will come into a revelation of 1 Corinthians 2 and 9. But as it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard nor have entered the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. Verses 10 through 14 says, these things God has revealed to us by the Spirit. Now, I want to stay there for a little bit. I want to walk us through this because here's what we tend to do, especially we who are theologians. What we tend to do is to dial that scripture down to merely a revelation of salvation of how God opens our eyes to the reality that we are saved. And that's right and that is good. But you need to read on. Listen to what it says because his spirit doesn't stop working and communicating with us once we come into salvation in Christ. He doesn't save you and then cut you off. Listen to what the rest of it says. The Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except their own spirit within them? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God, which is why Isaiah 55, 8 through 9 says this. For my thoughts, this is God talking, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. Now, church, listen to me. There are some things that God wants to show us and speak to us that are sometimes outside of the revelation of the revealed word of God. Listen now. They are revealed to you outside of you sitting down with a Bible in your hand, the written word that he speaks to you by his spirit. But again, even though it is outside of the written word, it will never violate the written word. And there are some thoughts of God that are so much higher that we can only know them by spirit to spirit. You cannot just know them by reading the Bible. He will speak some things to you that are not in the Bible for verbatim. There are some ways of God that are so much higher that he wants to reveal that are not revealed by verbatim in the Bible that we can only see, we can only know, and only receive if they are revealed to us by the precious Holy Spirit to our spirit. So read on. What we have received is not the spirit of the world but the spirit who is from God. Why? Why do we have the spirit of God? So that we may understand what God has freely given us. Look at me, church. The same person, the same Holy Spirit who assures you and gives you a revelatory understanding of a precious gift of salvation is the same person, the same Holy Spirit who gives us revelation of the things we now see that we've never seen before, that causes us to hear the things that we've never heard before. Please don't tell me that God does not speak to us other than by his written word. For he speaks to those who will humble themselves and draw nigh unto him and become intimate with him. He speaks to us spirit to spirit if we will listen. And we began talking about the properties of, the, of, of, of how the Holy Spirit works in the life of the Christian. Number one, we said number one, the Holy Spirit provides insight. And he enlightens. Number two, the Holy Spirit provides discernment. That's guidance. Thirdly, we found out that the Holy Spirit provides wisdom. That's revelation. Number four, the Holy Spirit provides conviction and correction. Number five, the Holy Spirit provides knowledge of what is to come. Now, John 16, 13 through 15. 
There it tells us that not only will God guide us, the Holy Spirit guide us into all truth, but if we will listen, he will show us, listen now, many times he will show us things to come. Let me ask you something. Have you ever said deja vu? Look at me, Christians. There is no deja vu to you. What we're doing is many times missing that the Holy Spirit is trying to tell us something. The Holy Spirit will show you something that it seems that I've saw this before. And the reason he's showing it to you is because he's letting you see this. Even though you never saw it before, it seems like you've seen it before because it's in your spirit. Because he's using that to point you to something that's ahead of you of something that is to come. Now watch this. The three most wonderful days of my life. December 19, 1981. I married my babe. February 27, 1984, my first daughter was born. November 17, 1987, my second daughter was born. And if there's anything that I've prided myself on, it is being a husband and a father who cared for his family. Nothing is more important to me other than my relationship with God than caring for my wife and caring for my daughters and taking care of them. But listen to me, what you see now, it didn't start out like this. January 1982, only weeks after we got married, Lady Brenda and I, my new bride and I, we started our 10-hour drive back to Springfield, Missouri, where I was in Bible college. Watch what happens. As I'm getting ready to pull off, my father walks over to the car. He pulls something out of his pocket, and then he says, I don't know why I'm doing this, but the Spirit of God just said to me, you're going to need this. What he handed me was a credit card. Now, I want you to understand something, church. Again, I prided myself, and I knew that I had Lady Brenda taken care of. I had already gotten the apartment. I had a job. Everything was great. We show up 10 hours later, and don't you know that God is a great revealer? He let us show up in the dark. You know why? Because as soon as we went in the apartment and she flipped on the light, roaches can't hide in the dark. Roaches started scattering all over the place. Now understand something. She'd never seen a cockroach in her life. Whenever she calls me by my whole name, I know that something is not right. And when I heard the echo from the other room, James Earl Collins! I said, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. You know why I said Jesus? Because I saw them too. And I, and I walked out and she said, what are these? And so I had to, to introduce her to what those were. And I said, baby, but listen. Missouri cockroaches are not like Chicago cockroaches. <laughs> Chicago cockroaches, like you burn up a Missouri cockroach, it'll burn up and it'll leave you alone. You burn a Chicago cockroach, it just leaves your apartment and goes to another. And so I said, babe, they're not the same. She goes, I'm not staying in this. Here's what I want to show you. Not only did we have an, an apartment we couldn't stay in, they had taken my job away and not even told me. We're in Missouri, no place to live. I've got no job. My father, God spoke to him and said, give this to your son. He's going to need it. We stayed in a hotel for three weeks until we got an apartment. And we stayed and we ate off of that credit card until I was able to get a job. I said that to say this. Do not tell me that God does not speak to us spirit to spirit. Listen now. A man with a testimony is never at the mercy of a critic. And please understand that the Holy Spirit, if you will seek him, many times will provide knowledge of what is to come so you're we're not caught off guard. Number six, the Holy Spirit provides strength in areas of times of weakness. Romans 8, 26 through 27. We read it earlier about how he helps us to pray for needs in ways that we don't know how to pray for them in the natural. Now, again, I'm going to say it again. Don't look at a person's life and go, oh, look at them. They're so blessed. See, it's easy to say that people are blessed when you're coming in when they're showing the credits. You miss the movie. Here's the problem. Many times the movie starts out and it's a hazard. There is warfare. There is everything going on that you never saw before. 
When Lady Brenda and I took our family and we went to Erie, Pennsylvania, listen to me very closely. We started a church from the ground, and starting that church from the ground, there was supposed to be a mothering church taking care of us. All I'm going to say without saying too much is that they made some promises they really didn't keep. And here we are. It's Christmas time. We have a saying. A man can be so broke and so busted he can't be trusted. That was me. And I'm walking the hallways of the, the, of the church and I'm going back and forth. And now, how many of you have ever had a pity party talking to God? How many of you have ever said, God, after all I've done for you, do you understand how I've sacrificed for you? I picked up my family. I move all the way down here. They aren't even paying me what I was making in my other job. God, what are you doing? And I'm walking in the hallway. And I'll never forget when God said, stop whining and start praying in the spirit. So I'm standing in the hallway. I'm walking back and forth. And I start praying in the spirit. I start saying, God, you know, oh, see, I feel it now. I feel it now. And as I'm praying in the spirit, I'm talking to God about how I need to meet my family. It's Christmas time. My family, I want to bless them. And as I'm walking back and forth and praying in the spirit, God said, it's settled, son. Just trust me. Two days later, I'm in my office. A young man, had to be in his 20s, knocks on the door walks in, stands across the desk from me. He says, you have never met me. You have never seen me before. But God told me to come in here and he said to bless you. And he pulled an envelope out of his back pocket, handed it to me. There was $2,500 in it. He said, have a Merry Christmas. I never saw him again. To this day, I wouldn't know him if I saw him. But I am telling you that if you will pray in the spirit, God will speak on your behalf. God will give you strength. He will pray when you don't know how to pray. That's the Holy Spirit. Number seven. The Holy Spirit provides comfort for the aching heart. John 16 and 7, nevertheless, I will tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. This is very fresh. For weeks now, I've been doing funerals that I wish I didn't have to do and the last one that I did as Lady Brenda and Pastor Lopez and I were sitting in the car waiting to go into the funeral home Lady Brenda gets a phone call she knows that her biological mother whom she only met a year ago is just short of going into the presence of God and they call her as we're getting ready to get out and they let her know it won't be long and she's got to be strong and get out and go into a funeral home and comfort others while in pain. Stay with me for a moment. Her adopted mother passed away. And then almost a year to the date, her adopted father passes away. God hears her cry and she meets her biological mother and she only had her in her life for one year. And now she is in heaven. And I turned to Lady Brenda yesterday and I said, I want you to know I'm proud to be your husband. You are, yes. I said to her, you are the hero who proves to me of what it can be like when we just submit to the Holy Spirit and let him comfort our aching hearts. I've watched her shed tears, but I've seen more joy than sorrow. Jessica made a statement to Lady Brenda one day, and she said, you need to understand that though you needed your family, they needed you more than you needed them. Because now even the ones that are Christians are finding comfort because she's telling them that there's a deeper walk with God. And in their shallow walks with God, they're becoming stronger in their walk with God because she's got some family that love the Lord. But watching her, they're able to draw strength. Here's what I'm saying. 
I am saying that the Holy Spirit, he is so precious. And we cannot afford to spend the rest of our days on this earth living as though he is a lesser member of the Trinity. We need the Holy Spirit because here's the conclusion of the matter. Number one, we need the Holy Spirit so that we might see things of the Spirit. 1 Corinthians 2 and 4, I love what Paul said. And my speech and teaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit of power. Let me slow down now. I am convicted and convinced that the word of God has every answer to every need and every question we have in life. I am talking about the word of God, the Bible. That's why I love to preach it. I love to teach it, not of my own speech and persuasive power. But what is its glorious ability to function and to operate all by itself? As the old preachers used to say, it does not need any of man's interpolation. <laughs> it's sufficient all by itself. But listen to me closely, church. There are times and situations in life when you don't have time to run home and look up a scripture that pertains to what you're dealing with in that moment in time. Somebody say, we need the Holy Spirit. There are times in life when you need an instant word from the Lord, say it again, we need the Holy Spirit. And the fact of the matter is that there are times and situations in life that you can't even find a direct word verbatim in the word of the Bible. Yet you need a word from the Lord that will back up his word. That's where the Holy Spirit comes alongside us and he begins to speak. Somebody say it again, we need the Holy Spirit. Now listen to me, church. He begins to speak and we don't know why, but we just obey him anyway. My dear friend, Dr. Mark Rutland, tells the story of preaching at a Christian businessman's convention. The meetings had been blessed and altar response was strong, but near the end of the service, a preacher who had been on the platform with him, he began to sense that God had given someone in the audience a specific word and that they should obey instantly. And so the rest of the preachers urged him to announce this. And when he did, the wife of a Methodist pastor came running up the aisle and she was weeping loudly. She wailed, I need a miracle in my life. Then she said, as I was praying, God said, you have a diamond ring on your hand that you inherited from your grandmother that is the most important thing in your life to you. And she said, no, Lord. You are the most important thing in my life. And God said, fine, then give that diamond ring away. Then she said, I have been fighting God this whole weekend over what? Over a diamond ring, and I'm about to miss my miracle. Because of not giving this diamond ring away. Let me stop right there and let me talk to our hearts for a minute. The spirit of possessions and materialism have robbed so many Christians, and some of you are listening to me right now of miracles that God is holding on to for you because you say he is the most important thing in your life, yet you won't even obey him in tithes and offerings. Forget about giving away a diamond ring. Because what so many of us fail to understand is that giving is to God, but it's for us. See, you're not doing God any favors when you tithe because you have to understand that you've got nothing he doesn't already possess. The cattle of a thousand hills are his. All the silver and the gold is his. So why are you trying to hold on to a little piece of gold when God said that the gold is so great in the kingdom of heaven that one day we're going to walk on the stuff? Because one more time, a man with a testimony is never at the mercy of the critic. And I can testify that if God can get it through you, he can get it to you. Am I saying that everybody ought to be giving rings and things away? No, what I am saying is that if you want to be blessed, if you need a need for a miracle in your life, you can't buy it. But let me tell you something, church. You can position yourself to receive one with one act of obedience. Mm -hmm. mm. She put that diamond ring in the hands of that leader of that, con of that convention. And she said, take this and use it for your organization. Watch this now. Just as she pulled that ring off of her finger, the miracle that she was praying for, it happened right then. Let the Holy Spirit talk to all of us, church.
Her Methodist preacher husband came running to the front and stood right beside her and he said, I want to receive the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Listen to me just for a moment. You have to understand, I said a Methodist preacher. You have to understand that one method the Methodists do not believe in is the method of speaking in tongues and getting things done praying in the Spirit. And he said, my wife received the baptism in the Holy Spirit and has been witnessing to me, but I couldn't believe it was real until this moment. Then he said, now I know it's real, pray for me. Suddenly, suddenly, the whole front of the hotel ballroom filled with people weeping and crying and seeking God and being filled with the Holy Spirit. Listen to me, church, watch this. The preacher's obedience unlocked that woman's which summoned her husband's, which in turn brought an outpouring of God's Spirit on all of them. Don't tell me that God does not speak to us. And listen to me very closely. How many of us have miracles that are still hanging out there because God is saying, come on, come on, just one step. One act of obedience and I'll release it into your life. How many of us, our miracle is still hanging out there? Dr. Rutland dropped this precious nugget. He said, do not misunderstand. Often the obedience that releases the greatest blessing may be the most demanding in one way or another. And if we will seek him, become intimate with him, he will show us things of the spirit, the things we have never seen before, and he will speak to us that which we have never heard before. Because the things that eyes have not seen and ears have yet to hear, they are revealed only by the spirit. Which tells me, God would say to somebody in this room, you've got to stop believing that a man holds your miracle. God holds your miracle. Now, don't get me wrong. God works through men. But see, he's not going to release it from a man's hand until you start looking at him instead of looking at them. Number two, we need the Holy Spirit's help because these are days of great deception. 1 Timothy 4 and 1 says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly in that latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. 2 Timothy 4, 3 through 4. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall heap to themselves teachers. Now, I want to kind of break this down, so stay with me. Why will there be those who will not endure sound doctrine? And why will they, after their own lust, heap upon themselves teachers? Read on, because they have itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from truth and shall be turned to fables. What are fables? They are myths, but they're deeper than that. They are things they have fabricated in their own mind. If you don't think that Christians are fabricating things, then you're not looking at a whole lot of them. The Greek word translated itching literally means to itch, rub, scratch, or tickle. It means to want one's ears tickled as to desire massages rather than messages. Sermons that charm rather than challenge. Entertain rather than edify. Please rather than preach. One commentator said this, these are people which have ears that continually have to be titillated with novelties. And here is the danger. Watch this, church. Itching ears is a figure of speech which refers to people's desires, felt needs, or wants. Now look at me just for a moment. Years ago, there came out a teaching about felt needs. And what it said to the church was that if you will start meeting people's felt needs, what they feel, if you'll start meeting their needs, if you'll start making things comfortable for them, you'll be able to reach lost people. Here's the problem. We went so far to make the church so comfortable that, listen to me, we lessened the power of God, and now what was once under our feet is over our heads. Because I want to tell you something. Now the church and the world look so much alike, you can't even hardly tell the difference. And it is these desires that impel a person to believe whatever he wants to believe rather than the actual truth itself. Remember what I said about discernment? It is the ability to see truth in spite of what one is told. Listen now, when people have itching ears, they decide for themselves what is right or wrong. And not only that, they seek out others to support their foolish notions. Let me tell you how I know you want to know the truth. When you go to people who will not support you no matter what you say, but you go to somebody who will say, I love you, but you're wrong. Mm. Somebody say, we need the Holy Spirit. 
Watch, now let me talk to you for a minute. Itching ears are concerned about what feels good or comfortable. I was reading an article about a guy who had, he said, one bad worship song and I, I left God and I left church. And, 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 and I, I saw the words to the song he was talking about and they were pretty shallow. But I'm like, man, you must be real shallow if a bad song makes you walk out on God. And he's writing this article and he's saying all these words. He's cussing and swearing all through the article. And there are Christians responding and supporting him. And here's what was crazy about it, though. His girlfriend said, oh, no, there's nothing wrong with that song. It's not about the words. It's about how it, how it makes you feel. It's about feeling good. That's what worship is all about. Listen to me very closely. You see, those that have itching ears, they are more concerned about what feels good and comfortable, not about truth, because truth can sometimes be very uncomfortable. The itching ear crew, they only want teachers who will give them the false hope to assure them that all is well. They are those of Jeremiah 6, 14, who want to hear peace and safety when there is no peace. And we have the evidence before us this day. Men stand in the pulpit and they preach popular messages that require no change. I want you to listen to the Holy Spirit. We preach as though repentance no longer applies to this present day generation. That people are basically good, that God is too loving to judge anyone. The cross with all its blood is no longer necessary. And we preach that God wants his children to be healthy, wealthy, and content in this demonically distressed world. Listen now. Some people, they will say, man, Man, Bishop, your, your sermons are so hard, and, 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 but we know you love us. No, no, no. You need to love truth, because if you love truth, you're going to even love the hard truth. Let me just talk to you for a moment. Who am I? The Bible says that some of the early followers of Jesus complained about his sermons. John 6, 60 and 66. Many of the disciples said, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? And then it goes on to say, from this time on, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. And in today's postmodern church, don't you see it today, church? Many are walking away from the hard truth. Churches that once preached sound doctrine now teach every evil acceptable which God condemns. Some pastors fear preaching passages that declare that God is masculine for fear of Christian feminists. And they deny the Heavenly Father. And listen to me, they deny that he is a father and they call him she. But I'm here to declare one more time. There is no mother nature and God does not have, have a feminine side. He is fully male and masculine and he is in complete control in this universe. We need the Holy Spirit to help us that we might not drift away. For indeed, these are the days of great deception. Let me go back and say it one more time. If there's anything the body of Christ needs to receive from the Holy Spirit, it is discernment, the ability to see the truth in spite of what one is told. Malachi 3.18. Watch this now. Then shall you return and discern between the righteous and the wicked, between him that serveth God and him that serveth not. Let me read that again. Then shall you return and discern between the righteous and the wicked, between him that serveth God and him that serveth not. Listen to me closely. Discernment. How desperately discernment is needed in the body of Christ. Because of the lack of discernment in the body of Christ, Satan has had the ability in this day to have a field day in so many churches, dividing his people because people do not discern between the righteous and the wicked, between those who are really doing the will of God and who is not. Ephesians 4.14 says that you will know when you have come to a place of spiritual maturity for you won't be blown away and blown around and tossed to and fro and carried away by every wind of doctrine. But we stop there. You got to go further. Listen to what it's, else it says. By the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. Wind of doctrine, didascalia, it means pointing not only to that which is taught, but to the authority of the one who teaches it as well. In other words, we are living in a day where we've got to quit chasing after and believing the teaching of some people who do not have the authority to teach what they are teaching. Listen to me very closely. When a man stands in the pulpit and he declares that I am not a preacher, I am, what do they call him? A life coach. The pulpit is not a place for a life coach. 
And we're listening to people on TV who declare I'm a life coach. Listen to me. There's no authority in that church. When I say authority, I'm not talking about a license to preach or an ordination certificate hanging on a wall. Men can certify that. We have gone so low that we are now sanctioning virtual bishops. You know what a virtu virtual bishop is? A violation of God's word. Because one requirement of being a bishop, you first have to have a church. Then you have to have other churches that are under your covering. See, I'm talking about being certified by God. I'm talking about divine order. I'm talking about where God is called the man, not men. And Paul says, you will know when you have matured because you won't follow after everything that comes flowing down the pike. Listen to me. If you're in a place where the word of God is being preached without compromise, hear the Holy Spirit. Now is not the time to go running off somewhere saying God told me to leave. Come on, church. It is time to hunker down. Get set in the house of God so that you can be like a tree planted by the rivers of living water and stay under the safety and the ark of the Holy Spirit. Because in these last days, believe me when I tell you this, only truth will keep you safe. And I am telling you, these are the days of great deception. And the devil will use people to say, God told me to get you out from under protective covering. 2 Thessalonians 2 and 3. Let no man deceive you by any means. For that day will come, not come, unless the falling away comes first. And the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God, or that is worship, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Now let me close by going back and saying it one more time. One of the driving purposes of the Holy Spirit is to continually deepen our relationship with the Father. And in this season of COVID, Pay attention now, pay attention. That has been, in my estimation, one of the major reasons that God has allowed us to go through this because I'm going to say it again. I said it when this first started. I believe that this whole season of trial is more about the body of Christ and the church than it is about the dirty, rotten, filthy sinners, though it is about them too. Listen to me, and I want you to hear this. As I was praying yesterday, God said this is not as much a trial as it is a test. And I fear that most of the body of Christ is flunking the test. You see, this thing, COVID, has drawn a dividing line in the spiritual sand. It's revealing the mature from the spiritually immature. Listen to me now. It is revealing where our love for God stands from those who just love church. When I say church, I'm talking about all that stuff that we have come to believe makes church church. Now, don't shut me down. I told you that the last three weeks, this has been very difficult times for so many families in our church. I stood at a funeral home for three weekends in a row. And by the way, not all of them were COVID-related deaths. In fact, most of them were, weren't. I said that to say to stop believing and be careful about believing everything the media is shooting out into your ears. Because there's a whole lot of statistics that are, they're calling COVID deaths that are not such just because the person, when they died, they had COVID. Let me tell you something. The devil is using the media and the government to put unwarranted fear in you. Trust in the Lord and lean not, not only to your understanding, but not to some other man's understanding either. I said all that to say this. I have done those three funerals and one prior to that. And even as my heart broke for those families, my heart also breaks for something that I believe is breaking the heart of God. Stay with me. I see people attend funerals, but won't come to the house of God. I see people go to restaurants, go to malls. Your mask is not hiding you from me, but won't come to the house of God. There are those who have the mindset that they will come back to the church when the church is church the way it used to be. Listen to me very closely. And if you're watching us on this stream, I love you. But if you need all the common ingredients you've come to know as church in order for you to come to church, you lack spiritual maturity. What God is trying to get us to do in one aspect is to mature to the place that we come to the church building in obedience to his word to not forsake the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some as we see the last days approaching and they are on us and we come because we want to worship with family and community, not because church is our crutch. Come on, somebody. 
See, if you have to have all of the common ingredients that too many have come to believe makes church church, then you need to allow the Holy Spirit to mature you. Let me love you, saints. I've had people make the comment to me that we know the word is important, but worship is important too. As if to say that singing, clapping, lifting hands, getting our feel-good moment is equally as important as the preaching, teaching, and receiving of the word of God. Listen to me. Worship, it, 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 is, way, it is important. But it is not as important as worshiping God through the preaching of the word. The word, that's what sets men free. And let me tell you something. Half of the time, we're not even paying attention to what we're singing. So we ain't getting free. We just like the tune. It's like boogie nights in the house of God. Let me speak to our dear hearts for a moment. Nobody knows the importance of worship more than me and my family. My wife and I, we traveled all over the United States in college singing and worshiping the Lord. I have been a worship leader almost all my life except for when there was somebody in the church who could do it. And now Jessica is doing it. Let me tell you something. Both of our daughters have been involved in worship for years and worship flows through every fiber of our being. I miss the singing of the worship in the house of God just like everybody else. Do you know that almost every day I, 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 I wake up and all that I can hear is Lion of Judah. <laughs> Listen to me. We miss it. But first of all, we've got to be conscious of those who we've got to protect from this dreadful virus. Even deeper than that, as much as I love worship, you need to understand that you do not understand the true essence of worship if you think that worship is merely singing songs. True worship is lifestyle, not singing, not music, not instrumental accompaniment. These are the elements of worship. If you cannot worship in God's house and worship him by receiving the preaching of the word, then your worship is not true worship. Listen to me. I love us, church, but we need to understand otherwise to sing, I need you, oh, I need you, is hypocrisy. If you only need him and want him in the form that you desire him in. There is a place that God is desirous of taking the church back to. It is that place where worship is once again about him and not about us. When, watch, watch this, church. When Matt Redman was a worship leader in a church in the late 1990s in Walford, England, the pastor sensed that their worship gatherings were going flat spiritually, that the congregation was just going, just going through the motions, and worship wasn't flowing from the heart like true Christian worship must. Redmond said there was a dynamic missing. So the pastor did a brave thing. He decided to get rid of the sound system and the band for a season, I mean a long season, and they gathered together with just their voices. His point was that they'd lost their way in worship and the way back to the heart would be to strip everything away. Listen now, there were no drums, there were no guitars, there were no microphones. In fact, there was no sound system. No worship leader standing in front of the band in the congregation having to act and perform like a cheerleader in order to get people to worship the God they say they love so much. Listen to me, there was no sound where you could feel the heartbeat with every thump of the kick of the drum. Redmond said, you can imagine that the group didn't know what to do sitting in the room with nothing but their Bibles and temporary silence. Let me tell you something. You try that now, and three quarters of the church will backslide. And here we are 20 years later, sitting in the midst of the voice of God, speaking through a virus, and we're right back where they were then. For if it were about him, people would show up even though church as they knew church is not the church they once knew. We've got people in this church building right now who stand at the door for three services. Let me talk to us. Because some who can, who say they love God, don't come. I'm just trying to help us. Listen now. We don't come here to feel him. We come here to meet him, and then we feel him, to worship him. See, 
here's, here's what, what I'm going to say, and you can believe me or not, and I may be wrong when I get to heaven, but I'm believing that because we weren't bold enough to do it, God did it. Because we have sold out the Holy Spirit in righteousness and holiness for desperation of having worship that resembles a worldly concert more than worship unto God to the point that we will let people lead worship who we know are cultivating lives of sexual immorality, sexual perversion, and any other kind of lifestyle. And so God did what many of us refused to do. He wants his church to mature. This is God speaking through me now. And get back to what it truly means to have a heart of worship. And am I telling you that this is one of the works God is trying to do through the Holy Spirit in our lives as Christians? I am. To bring us back to an understanding of what it means to truly have a heart of worship. To worship God in spirit and in truth. Because those who worship in spirit and in truth will be led by the Spirit. And if we ever needed to be truly led by the Spirit, we are living in that day. Matt Redman, who I just told the story of, he wrote a song that says the heart of worship. Listen to it. When the music fades and all is stripped away and I simply come longing just to bring something that's of worth that will bless your heart. I will bring you more than a song for a song in itself is not what you have required. You search much deeper within through the way things appear. You're looking into my heart. I'm coming back to the heart of worship and it's all about you. It's all about you. Jesus, I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it when it's all about you. It's all about you. Jesus, King of endless worth, no one could express how much you deserve. Though I'm weak and poor, all I have is yours. Every single breath, I bring you more than a song, for a song in itself is not what you have required. You search much deeper within through the way things appear. You're looking into my heart. I'm coming back to the heart of worship, and it's all about you. It's all about you. Jesus, I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it when it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let me close. A few years back in Texas, a pilot left the motor running on an airplane. Somehow that plane engaged itself, and it was without a pilot, and it still took off. It was flying on its own and it stayed in the air for 90 minutes. Then the inevitable happened. Let me talk to the non-Christians first and the spiritually shallow. For a while, you can fly on your own. For a while, you can take off and be somebody. For a while, you can act like God doesn't exist. For a while, you can play a little religion but not be serious about subordinating yourself. And for a while, you can fly. Now, let me bring those who love Jesus into this now. I know there are atheists and they look like they're flying. I know sometimes you look at evil people and you say, how come they can be so evil and fly so high? I know sometimes you're jealous because I've been there when you look at folks who have no respect for deity and they seem to be flying high. Listen to me. I'm going to tell you something, church. Keep watching because sooner or later they will run out of gas. They will crash and they will be destroyed. When you fly your life without God in the pilot and you don't put him in the seat, he is not your co-pilot. He wants to be the pilot. When you don't do that, when that happens, non-Christian, Shallow Christian, now is the time to get right with God. Those of you who love Jesus, don't you grow weary in well-doing? That's why the Bible says don't be evil, don't be envious of evildoers. Just because they're making money and getting ahead by doing wrong, don't be jealous of them. One can fly high on their own for a while, but there will come a point where they will run out of gas. and They will discover in an abrupt way there is a God who is Lord over the universe. But God says to you who love Jesus, in these last days, the one who endures to the end shall be saved. Come on, somebody. We are not in a sprint. This is a marathon. And the tragedy is to run all the miles and then give out on the 
remaining few yards. There are some that stopped running a long time ago. There are others, they're thinking about giving up. Listen to Bishop. We're at the end of the marathon. I don't know if it's going to be one year, 10 years, 20 years from now, but believe this preacher when I tell you, we're no longer at the beginning of the marathon. We're at the end. We are yards away from the finish line. And we need the Holy Spirit because these are times of great, great, listen, deceit, deception. But to those who know the Holy Spirit, he who endures to the end shall be saved. Throw your hands up now. Oh, just say, come on, Holy Spirit. Glory. Welcome, Holy Spirit. You are the potter. I am the clay. Mold me. Shape me. After your will, while I am waiting, yield it and still. Glory. Bless you. Hallelujah. Can we put our hands together one more time? Hallelujah. My God. Well, blessings, Eagle Heights family. Thank you for joining us today. Now is the time to worship the Lord with his tithe and our offerings. Amen. Our special offering today is for the media ministry. And media is a powerful tool. It has the ability to keep us connected. But let me just say this, and, and, and I like it when God puts things together. I don't know what bishops go. I hear it just like you hear it. But it was in my spirit. Nothing takes the place of attending the service. Nothing. So if you're listening online, pre-register. It's time to get on your feet. Amen. Don't let nothing hold you back. I remember just a couple of weeks ago, Bishop said, get to the water. Get to the water. So let me say also, please sow your very best. There may be some people that are unable to come. We understand that. But sow your very best to the media, uh, uh, media uh, uh, ministry so that it keeps us up to date and it helps us provide the best quality that we can. Let me say one other thing. As we approach Thanksgiving, we do have the hands full of rights every year. And this is a great way to show your thankfulness to God, your gratitude, by making sure that somebody else is blessed during Thanksgiving season. So this is the time to be able to do that. Mark your calendars. I said it last week. Please mark your calendars for November 15th. It's coming. It's approaching. That's when we have our Bishop Appreciation Annual celebration because he he was installed as bishop he said i i didn't know he was going to say that but november 13th so november 15th let's bless the man of god amen praise god let me also say just an update on the parking lot we built the wall <laughs> we built it hallelujah with god's help in our sowing that wall got built we also pack the land with stone so that we can use it before it gets paved. That was an added cost of about just a little bit over $13,000. And I need to tell you, church, a single mother who had already sold $20,000 for that project, single mom, she called. She called and she said, I want to bless with $10,000. Now, now, get this, get this, because I, I love how God works. Here's what she says. She says, at night, I haven't been able to sleep. She, could, she goes, because I'm supposed to sow. God is telling me I'm supposed to sow this seed. So I, I haven't been able to sleep. Here's what I told this mother, because the first thing that came to my spirit, I said, 
some people own money, but for some people, the money owns them. And so I said to her what Bishop said in his word. If God can get it through you, God will get it to you. Amen? Amen, church? Come on, we got to wake up. We got we to gotta break, break these cords. We got to wake up. Listen, I'm pretty sure that this mother didn't start by giving $10,000. But it all begins by understanding that to give back to God is an act of worship and an act of obedience. And so God trusts her. Because God knows I can put it. If you start with the small, he'll bring you to the greater. God knows that. He knows that. Pastor Rick Warren once said, if you respond correctly in this season of life, and if you do the right thing, even when you don't feel like it, you'll reap a great dividend in the future. You'll reap it. It was the obedience of a single widow mother that caused jars of flour and oil to never run empty during a famine. And what God did yesterday, he can do it today. Amen? We're not done yet. We're not done yet. I remember Jojo White. His words was, we got work to do. Remember that? We got work to do. He always had those words. We got work to do, church. I remember those words. Let's continue to sow towards that parking lot. We're not finished yet. I'm telling you, that has significance. When God's talking to somebody and saying, I need you to sow this, God is doing something. We may not see the entire thing, but that thing's got a significance. So please, church, we're going to keep raising funds, keep giving as God leads you, because we got more to do out there. Can somebody say amen? Praise God. Praise God. Father, we give you glory, honor, and praise. Everything is yours. The Bible tells us the earth and all that it contains belongs to you. God, we're thankful that we're managers. And you allow us, dear God, to be good stewards of what you put in our lives and in our hands. And so, Father, help us to do this in a way that it brings a cheerful smile to you. But it blesses your kingdom and it blesses your people and your plan. Your will gets done. Father, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. First, I want to remind you that Lady Brenda has put up the signs, but next Sunday, next Saturday, you want to do this. You want to get yourself an extra hour of sleep. You want to fall back. So make sure you do that. That is always a hallelujah time in the Collins house. So you want to do that. The second thing, I want to reinforce what Pastor Lopez said. I know and I understand there are some people who cannot come to church, and some of them shouldn't. But there is a bulk of the kingdom of God who can. And this is test time. And we need to pass the test, church. Because if we pass the test, when God allows us to come back full force, we're going to appreciate it a whole lot more for the right reasons. Amen. There is something the Apostle Paul said. He says, I am chasing after the one who ran me down. So if I can catch him, paraphrase, then my life will be full. It'll be full of life and full of hope if I can catch him. Now Paul knew that he couldn't literally apprehend him but that was the pursuit because he understood that he had been apprehended. And here's my thing to us. When you know that you have been apprehended, Paul, they tried to kill him so many times. Every time they did something to Paul, he popped back up and said, not yet. When it finally came time to leave this earth, Paul said, all right, I'm ready. I'm making my exit on my terms. On God's terms, not on man's terms. Let me tell you how that works. When you are in the perfect will of God, even in the bowels of hell, the devil cannot take you out until God says so. 
And the only way to operate in the perfect will of God, trust me on this, is to be in a continual pursuit of him. We're going to talk about the ways that he speaks to us next week and how we know that it's actually him talking. Because generally when we hear voices, it's one of three voices. God, the devil, and everybody say, me. Uh-huh. And so we want to chase after him. We want to try and catch him. Lift your hands where you're seated right now. Just go ahead and do that in his presence. Surrender. And say, draw. Draw me, Lord, and I will run after you. Say, draw. That sounds good, church. Draw me, Lord, and I will run after you. Say, call. Midnight hour, just call me, Lord, and I will run after you. Please call me, just say my name and call me, Lord, and I will. Say, draw me, draw. I feel you, draw me, Lord, draw me, Lord. And I will run after you. Say, draw me, draw. the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord smile on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord show you his favor and give you his peace. 
Eagle Heights Cathedral, it's been a pleasure to worship with you again. I want to remind you to turn your clocks back this Saturday, October 31st for Daylight Savings. If you'd like to join us in person, visit our website, ehconline.org, and register for one of three services at 8.30, 10.15, and 12 p.m. We look forward to seeing you soon.